Hello, everyone. Welcome to our evening of ski movies here. Um, this all started when, when Scott Stearns came to an Okimo Valley TV station meeting and said, hey, I got this idea for a film festival focused on outdoors, in Vermont, local, um, and, and we kind of took it from there. Um, we have some, some grand plans, and, and this is kind of our first, our first stab at it getting some, some local local folks who've produced some, some cool ski films here focused in, um, in Vermont and, and here. And so this wouldn't be possible without support from FOLA, from the Boot Pro, the Book Nook, Unofficial Chemo, OMS, um, everyone, everyone kind of came together to, to help support local, um, local adventure here in, here in Vermont. The main film of the night, uh, 300 Miles Melting, um, which was produced um, by Connor Davis um, and Ansel Dickey, both, both local folks here. Um, I, I know Connor very well, and he, uh, he's someone who grew up skiing here, has, has some deep family ties here. Um, went out west for school, and, and we got him back east, and he, uh, he started Eastern Adventure, um, an ad agency, and he's up in, up in Portland now, um, but they created um, this film, 300 Miles Melting, which, um, which follows the Catamount Trail, um, and, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of let you see the film about what, what that's about, um, but we have some, some founding members from the Catamount Trails Association here with us tonight, um, who are going to answer some questions and, and give us a little give us some history. Um, this is the 40th anniversary um, of, the, of the Catamount Trails Association, so um, pretty, pretty special thing and something that we're uh, very pr privileged to have in our backyard. Um, you know, it's easy to see the big mountains out west and, and see all that, that fun adventure, but um, as someone who's, who's lived in Ludlow and Vermont their whole life, there's, there's a lot of adventure we have right in our in our backyard, and sometimes it just takes a little more effort to find it, but uh, but it's there. So, yeah. This year has been really warm. This is the second major snowstorm that we've gotten. In the beginning, we got a few snowstorms, but it melted within a few days, and then it kept going up to 40 degrees, which is unprecedented the previous four years. No, there's no way we would just hit that wall, and since then, we just haven't gotten those snowfalls. This is the pace. This snow is a lot easier than the wetter snow that I was trying to get from this one. I've never understood people who uh, you'll meet people, you know, at the cash register or something in the winter, and they'll say, well, I hope winter's over soon, or I'm always like, why do you live in Vermont then? Um, this is the best part of the entire beautiful year. For a few months, you know, the snow falls, and then friction gives up its hold on the planet. You get to glide across its surface. It's magic, utter magic. You know, the experience of being on the trail, I think particularly um, the experience of being surrounded by the just mystical and transformative force of snow <laughs> um, is, is similar in many ways to a broader value that just generally bring, being in the outdoors can bring. I think the topography of Vermont plays a role in that too. Everything is so close and compact. There's all these little pockets, you know, and, and, uh, and sound doesn't travel that far, you know, through the valleys and over the ridgelines and things. And so you can feel, especially in the winter, really far away from it all, even though it's not a big state and you're not that far from a town probably. And I think the, 
you take that general value proposition of the outdoors and then you get out on a place like the Catamount Trail and it's like on steroids. I've been saying I don't want this to be another athlete existential crisis story. Though that's still true, I'm starting to come to terms with the reality that time in the outdoors, especially when you're pushing yourself physically, mentally, and emotionally, will change you. I am excited to meet the person I'll become after this adventure, no matter, no matter how, how it how turns it out. out. My name is Tori Lee Brooks. I am trying to through ski the Catamount Trail uh, south to north. The Catamount Trail is a 317-mile Nordic backcountry ski trail, and it runs from the Massachusetts border, south of Vermont, to the Canadian border, and north of Vermont. It's a combination of different trail styles, but it's available for public use and to go for a really long ski. <laughs> places it's following old logging roads, some places it's going through a Nordic ski center, um, some places it's this narrow little single track that um, you wouldn't know existed unless there were some markers up on the up on the trees. It was established by a group of you know young people in the, in the 80s that had a vision to um, celebrate a connection with the landscape that Nordic skiing could offer and that the Vermont landscape could offer in a really unique way. So the Catamount Trail was started in 1984. It was uh, really the dream of a few friends looking for backyard adventure. Stephen Bushy, journalist, cartographer, and outdoorsman, he's an avid recreational enthusiast, especially where cross-country skiing is concerned. So uh, Steve Bushy came up with this idea, like, hey, could we ski the length of Vermont? The creation of a route that could revolutionize cross-country ski touring. The Catamount Trail is essentially a second long trail, but for skiers. An adventure that lasts a couple of days. It isn't over in an afternoon. It's something that anybody, really, who has the desire to do it could, could do it. And then subsequent to that, founded the Catamount Trail Association um, in an effort to and make the, the route that they had skied official. and But that sort of sense of like supporting adventure close to home, uh, building community through skiing has really sort of remained central to the organization and, and our mission. I have bony ankles. So I'm gonna, I'm going with the, the pre-ankle tape in case they rub, and we're gonna be breaking in boots a little bit as we go. <laughs> so, wish my feet luck, and we'll see how many toenails I end up with. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. very faint end of cat. So once I start, I'm just gonna keep moving. Yeah, just sprint it out. Okay, we're gonna go ski it. Go get him. <laughs> the Long Trail was the first really long distance hiking trail in the world, dating back to the 19th century in Vermont. But the Catamount Trail was such an inspired idea because it's the kind of winter version of the same. It was just complete magic to be able to go these places that you could sort of see on the map, but if someone hadn't done the work of kind of laying out the trail and getting landowners to agree and stuff, would just have always been terra incognita on that map. And instead there you were able to cut right through it. <laughs> 
Well, the Catamount Trail is a, is a unique trail. I mean, it shares a lot of uh, qualities with some other long distance trails across the country in that it's a statewide trail. Um, so it's really a landscape trail. It's unique in that it's a winter only trail. It's designed for skiing and snowshoeing. Uh, and it's the longest backcountry ski trail in North America. So not only is it a beautiful trail, it's a beautiful idea. This thing that we hold in common, Americans aren't so good always at relinquishing any of their rights to property and, you know, but instead of putting up a no trespassing sign, people who put up a trespassing sign, you know, come make use of this remarkable place. first GoPro selfie video. So day one, look at this cute little bridge. Morning of day two, we get to go under a log. <laughs> day long walks on the beach. <laughs> at the reservoir. I'm working a little harder than I would like to be. You know, I think that's the, the case when you're breaking trail which, you know, I knew was a big possibility when it snowed a ton. And I'm happy for the snow, but it's a lot more work. Oh boy. Thread in the needle. Oh. <laughs> Glad I got that on film. <laughs> uh. The way the snow is falling is definitely changing. Um, it feels like instead of consistent snow, we get these kind of extreme freeze-thaw cycles and like larger storms, um, but it's less frequent. Snow was super sticky all morning. So it was just like stuck to my skis and the polk <laughs> for like the first four hours of the day and I was breaking trail. I was putting in a lot of work today. That many miles in nature is exciting. And seeing how much the Catamount Trail Association and different landowners and organizations have come together to make that trail. Doing trail maintenance and coming up with new routing for trails, I wanted to experience it and see it for myself. Because it's a winter only trail, it can go through all of these areas that you can't access in the summer. They'd never let you build a hiking trail um, through some of the places that, that we can put a ski trail because of the relative impacts of, of a ski trail versus a hiking trail or mountain bike trail and the relative impacts of winter use versus summer use, we're just able to access some areas that are really unique and cool. You know, we go through um, some old growth forest, which is really rare in Vermont. You know, 90%, 80, 90% of the state was deforested 120, 130 years ago. And so there's not a lot of old growth and we go through some of that and these, it's in these really wet, seepy areas. Um, there's hermit thrush habitat up there. It's just really cool. And you, you couldn't put a hiking trail through there. The terrain wouldn't, just wouldn't work, um, but you can ski through it. The places you're able to go and the way in which you can just explore the woods, there's a, such a freedom to it. So this must be an old railway cut that's now kind of grown in and you've got some logs, got some ice falls. It's definitely also a stream bed, so hopefully I don't fall in, but it's really beautiful. Wow. As you're seeing along the Catamount Trail and looking 100 feet in each direction along the entire trail alignment. The trees within your view are sequestering 1.4 million 
metric tons of carbon or 3,200 metric tons per year. And in total, that's an equivalent to distance traveled by 8 million cars. So climate change is the biggest thing that humans have ever done, and by far. Raising the temperature of the Earth means changing the way that everything that happens on the face of the Earth happens. It's introducing huge amounts of extra energy into a closed system. At a certain point, you run up against the threshold, a physical threshold that is undeniable and insurmountable. Ice melts at zero degrees Celsius. It will melt at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. No matter how much technology we put into that, you cannot stop physics. It doesn't really matter what you believe or not. It's coming. It's, it's, it's physics, you know. Physics is immature. It doesn't compromise. It doesn't meet us in the middle. It doesn't understand that we're in a tough economic stretch, whatever. It just does what it's going to do. So our job is to meet the bar that it sets. I am Dr. Elizabeth Burakowski. I am a researcher here at the Institute for the Study of Earth, Oceans, and Space at the University of New Hampshire. So here at UNH, I study winter climate, specifically in the northeastern United States. I look at how it changed in the past and what we can expect to see in the future. We want to know when we lose snowpack, how does that affect forest health? How does that affect ski resorts? And how does that affect winter recreational opportunities? And there's the scientific component, looking at the data, and then there's the lived experience. And with the winter recreation industry, what we know is that they match up really nicely. It, it just feels like the swings between within the ski seasons are so extreme. The last couple of days, we're just watching people get stuck. Outdoor recreation is obviously a hugely important economic driver for a place like Vermont, but I think it also has a huge psychological component. That's like who we are. It's why a lot of people are here, you know. it's. Um, and so if you couldn't do it, it wouldn't just be that you were losing money, it'd be like you were losing the point of being here, of being alive, of whatever it is. We had relatively stable climate through the 50s into the 60s, and then a rapid uptick in winter temperatures, such that winters in New England are the fastest warming season that we see. So in New England, we've seen changes. We've seen closures of major resorts and small resorts as well. Across the U.S., we've lost 600 plus ski resorts since the 1950s. There's about 500 remaining now. And a lot of those that survive are the bigger ones. The ones that we've lost are the smaller ones that maybe only had a single rope tow or a double chairlift. But those were the affordable ones. Those are the ones where you can take your kid on a Saturday afternoon for $10 a ticket. And when those are lost to the community, there's you know a community center that ends up getting lost as well. It's not just dollars and cents, it's community. The trail's power comes from the relationships that are built by getting out on it between people and the community that's built by getting out and skiing and maintaining the trail and, and all these sorts of things. And so we work really hard to ensure that you know, there's sustainable and equitable access to, to Vermont's backcountry is our, our mission. Many months out of the year you can go hiking you know, on certain trails or you can ride a bike on certain trails. And But I think the, the fact that this is a trail that's really dictated by its ability to hold its users, um, it, it's this ephemeral and fleeting quality that again goes back to that tying into a force that's larger than yourself and I think part of what creates a really transformative experience. Like you're on the edge, you know, not knowing that today will work or not work to be out there. Good morning. It is cold. My boots are frozen. Day six, seven? Day seven. It snowed last night, as you can see. It sounds like I'm in for quite the day. These are my socks from yesterday. This is really hard. <laughs> if 
find friends who find you on the trail, bring you coffee and <laughs> pastry. Middlesex is finest. <laughs> oh, this is the way you're supposed to see the catamount. <laughs> Things have vastly improved. This whole section, almost this whole section, is beautifully groomed. Snowmobile trails next to a river. Well, one of the things that makes me optimistic about the future of the Catamount Trail is knowing how uniting the issue of parks, trails, and outdoor places and public land are for American people. People vote in support of nature. A few years ago, a really important landmark legislation was passed called the Great American Outdoors Act. And this provided permanent and significant funding for conservation and outdoor recreation in America. And it was something that was one of the few bipartisan pieces of legislation. So, you know, at this time today where a lot of us are wringing hands about climate change and about partisanship, you know, we know that the experience of getting outdoors, however many places it looks, like the Catamount Trail and other places like neighborhood parks, it's just something that people get behind. And I think people really understand that this is about healthy people, healthy communities, and a healthy world. And people are willing to show up for that and vote for it. The most important thing an individual can do is be a little less of an individual and join together with others in movements large enough to change the political and economic ground rules. Because 73% of the emissions that we see come from energy production that is outside of our hands. Your individual actions are very unlikely to move the needle, unfortunately. So recognizing that these types of solutions need to be supported by government action. They need to have policies and initiatives to support them and to make that transition away. That's what we're up against. And so I, I'm, I'm deeply optimistic. And I think that the more we can hear stories of people being agents of change, goal-oriented, hopeful change makers, folks like Tori, people like those that founded the Catamount Trail and all the people that love it, we're gonna, we're gonna meet the challenge ahead. We have to. Is it possible to do it alone? Maybe, under the right conditions with a lot of luck and skill and fitness and preparedness. But we have much more success by breaking up the challenge into bite-sized chunks and sharing the experience with those around us, relying on their help, their excitement, and their support. Either way, the miles pass, and soon enough we find ourselves at the Canadian border or with a healthier planet that we pass down to our children looking back at how far we've come with awe and pride. Which challenge do we tackle next? Life's too short to get it all right. First time around, you better not fuck up. Wanna be born again, I want a second chance.
is the best. Because I'm starting to think I'm allergic to something. Either that I'm eating or that I'm using on my face. Because I have never seen my eyes so puffy. And this is now happening every morning. I feel okay for the most part. I'm tired. Yes. What's up, Tori? Wait a minute. I've been here before. star of the show here is my Chef Boyardee can that I put in among the boiling water. Finally happened. I just dropped my polk into that river. <laughs> <laughs> I have skied and walked. <laughs> 300 miles. <laughs> Sit on whatever I want. <laughs> there you go. Hey. Oh, so proud of you. Oh, that was unbelievable. Thank you. So, who wants to go skiing? <laughs> That's something special about ski films is whenever it's done, it just makes you want to get out there and enjoy it. So um, yeah, thank you for, for all the supporters who all put this on. Um, really great to, great to see all that. And I don't know if anyone caught it. Catamount Trail started 1984, so 40 year anniversary. Um, so that's what um, some of the guys who started it along with Ludlow's own Bob Brandt are, are skiing it this year. Um, so they're gonna they're going to get up and chat a little bit, but before we do that, we're going to do our, do our raffle. <coughs> if anyone else wants to get anything before. Yeah. Okay, the Book Nooks coffee table book. You want to pick? Two three nine six eight five. Oh, got it. Wendell. There's a bag attached to that. <laughs> Isn't it all together? No. It's separate. Oh, separate? Okay. So gloves? So some gloves from the Boot Pro, Alice Nitka. All right. Well, Alice, you're, you're going to be all set and ready to go because you got the second one, too. <laughs> <laughs> You sure you don't want it? <laughs> um, 239605. Yeah. Alice there. Hey. How about some uh, cat tracks, India pale ale? Oh, and a, and a very nice. Oliver. Uh, yeah, whatever. Okay. Yeah. And a hefty 
Yeah, yeah that's a double gap. Pat Moore. And the unofficial chemo swag bag, Michael S. And the big one, the pair of skis. I'm paying attention. Scott Bates. All right, so I will uh, now invite the Catamount Trail crew up here and we can have them chat about some stuff. Good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm Bob Brandt. I'm from Ludlow. Um, we are skiing the Catamount Trail this year, the Ruby Run. Uh, luckily, I passed the interrogation by the Founding Fathers, and they let me come along for the joy. Um, we are skiing the length of Vermont. We left uh, Massachusetts, oh, back on Thursday, a week ago, and we're now up as far as Greendale. And tomorrow we will res resume uh, continuing on through uh, heading north. So the, we're doing this 40th anniversary tour to try to bring awareness to the Catamount Trail because it is a gem. Uh, Vermont should be very proud. It goes the whole length. It's right in our backyard, uh, almost everybody's backyard. And uh, it's, it's just so nice to get out there and like Matt Williams said in the, in the film, um, you go places and see places that you wouldn't ordinarily see. And it's, it's just a wonderful ski. So we are also trying to raise some money um, to protect the other 25% of the trail that is not permanently protected. Because uh, we could lose some of that and then we lose, lose our length of Vermont ski. But I have have brought along a couple of fine gentlemen, uh, Ben Rose and Paul Harris, and uh, they, along with Steve Bushy, came up with the idea 40 years ago. And uh, Steve is following us through Garmin and telling us when we get off the trail. So uh, he is still the map maker and keeping us in line. And uh, if you have any questions, we'd uh, try to answer them. And just to uh, correct the record, uh, Bob is a board member, um, a trail chief, a tour guide, and um, if there's anybody I'd ever want to have to, if I had to get out of the woods quickly, it would be Bob to do it. So he's, he's been essential to our trip. He knows the trail so well, so he's modest, overly modest. <laughs> um, it, it's really, thank you all for coming. It's, it's uh, pretty amazing for Ben and I and Steve as we talk to him, because 40 years ago, there was no trail. You may have seen in the, um, the, the map and compass we, work we were doing back then to get through Vermont. Um, it was just an idea and a concept. Um, I have to say, I've been somewhat awed going out, um, and in the middle of nowhere, there's a trail marker, <laughs> or there's a sign that's carved from the Forest Service. So wow, they finally accepted this trail. But also to meet people like Bob and like Jay and like Kevin, who have dedicated so much time to this trail is what's really made it real through Vermont. Um, it's, it's not just a concept 40 years later, it is an actual trail. Um, and if you haven't been on it, I would encourage you, whether that's at a Nordic Center or you know, just a trail here in Ludlow or, or somewhere nearby, you know, get out. As Bob said, it is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, our first day out, we saw moose. Um, we have seen uh, you know, quail, we've seen 
mink tracks. It just the wildlife is unbelievable, um, and the beauty of it is unbelievable. So, um, really encourage you to get out and take a look. Um, and if if you like it, become a member and join this tremendous community. We um, have a, a, our filmmaker coming along, Jay, and another Evan who helped make that last film. And one of the things that Jay does is ask people we meet along the trail, what does this trail mean to you? And I have to say, I've been absolutely awed to hear. I mean, one couple goes, well, we fall in love on the Clatamount Trail. <laughs> or other people will get a distant look and they'll go, well, this is my happy place. This is where I come for peace. So there's this whole community wrapped around the trail now. So it's this three-dimensional thing. It's not two dimensions on a map. And really encourage you to get involved. What he said. <laughs> um, he, he doesn't ever let me get the last word in, so just wait. <laughs> well, first of all, let's talk about the f two films we just saw. I, on the first film, um, I, I will say that um, we could do any of those things. Um, Until we hit the ground. Once, once, if shot out of a cannon. If shot out of a cannon, we could do it once. Um, and on the second film, that, the fact that people are seeing the Catamount Trail as something that's a symbol of winter and uh, an expression of why winter is worth caring about and saving, is very moving. I mean, to see the Catamount Trail um, not just happen, but become something that people love and connect to so powerfully um, has made me an optimist for life. I mean, we were very fortunate because our friend Steve had this idea, not just of taking a ski trip, but uh, of, of the fact that a trail could exist, connecting the ski touring centers and realizing that there were already people in parts of Vermont skiing from one town to the next. And if we could find those people, some of whom we've met again now 40 years later, um, and, and, and knit it together into a trail the length of Vermont, a winter analog of the Long Trail, um, and then to see people run with that idea. Um, the leadership on the Catamount Trail Association board, seeing the nonprofit model work again, just as it did 100 years earlier with the Long Trail, uh, it made me an optimist for life. And uh, I, uh, so um, that's, I, I'll stop there. Let's, let's take a couple questions and uh, thanks for coming out. And please um, support the Catamount Trail if you can. It's uh, one of those, only in Vermont things. Yeah. That's is, our job. Uh, is camping allowed anywhere along the uh, trail? National forest land. Yeah. yeah. Uh, national forest land. Uh, it is. It is allowed. Um, we we are not camping along the trail. We're coming out at night and taking a hot shower, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> It also, we, when there, we were just, I'm sorry. Well. There, there are private parcels um, that, that I'm sure they'd prefer you not, not camp, but, um, you know, it's, it's winter time, and if you check, check on the trail map and find out who the landowners are, I'm sure you could probably get permission. We had made the decision 40 years ago to not camp. We were avid winter campers, and Steve and I used to teach it at University of Vermont, but... The, um, we wanted to, to design something that was ex as accessible and appealing to people as possible, which is why we tried to take all of, as many of the cross-country ski centers back then as possible and link them together along the trail. And back then there were a lot more than there are now. And also we realized that if we winter camped, people would see it as some extreme thing um, that, that wasn't as accessible. We also were in our 20s and all these inns along the way offered us a night's stay. <laughs> what more could you ever possibly ask for? We probably couldn't afford to stay there now. So, um, it, it, we, you know, we, from the beginning, we had an, uh, an eye on how do we make this as appealing as possible. And it's worth pointing out, there is some section of trail that anyone can ski, no matter what your ability. Um, there are other sections where you want to be quite confident. You want to be a bob um, before you get out there because um, they're very technical. Um, but there is something for everybody along the trail.
So you've been out for a few days now. How's the snow and how's your feet? I would say the snow's been variable. <laughs> uh, it was wet and mushy down south, uh, 45 degrees and 50 for three days. And uh, coming up through, we started getting a freeze up, um, turned harder. A couple days ago was sheer terror skiing. Um, yesterday was absolutely the best. We had four inches of powder and uh, just, just fantastic. So it, it all, it depends on the snow conditions and you take what you got and go with it. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I was wondering what your favorite part of the trail is. Do you each have your own favorites or is it a combined favorite? I guess I'll start. Um, I should say my favorite section is 11 South because I maintain that, <laughs> but uh, if, you, if you ski the trail, each section has its own unique beauty and character. Um, and, and to say one is better than the other, um, I can't do that. I, I, have, I just enjoy every section um, as it comes and enjoy what it has to offer. Yep. Uh, for me, it depends on the day. <laughs> and any section can be a beautiful, easy, glorious ski. Any day can be dangerous. Um, in terms of sections, um, there are some places along the trail that are really special. Uh, and just to rattle some off, um, uh, I, lo I love Craftsbury. Uh, I love the... Um, the Honey, Hill, uh, the Honey Hollow Trail that comes down to Lunuski off of Camel's Hump because it's close to where I live in Williston. I love the natural turnpike where you're running along looking up at Mount Abraham and Mount Ellen. Uh, I love uh, down here because of the this, this snow belt of southern Vermont. I mean, the Mount Tabor Road is really beautiful uh, because of this incredible snowpack. Um, and then you just... You, you get to ski for, well, it was three weeks when we were 20-somethings. We're planning five weeks as 60-somethings. Um, and, but you get to ski for 300 miles, and you really never see anything ugly. It's, it's amazing. Other than each other. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I would say it, it, it really, because conditions change, the sun changes, the snow, can, snow changes, so... It's hard to say what's the favorite section because it depends on the day you skied it and what it was like. But for me personally, I love the open glades, and we had some yesterday with some nice glade skiing. And also when you're skiing through the tunnels of the pines, it's just you know absolutely beautiful. But I'd say for the last week as we're getting in shape, it was the last mile that was my favorite every day. <laughs> Uh, would you tell us about your ski gear? What skis, boots, do you vary them according to the conditions? You know, it's ch I'd say it's changed. <coughs> 40 years ago, we skied it with you know regular cross-country ski gear, no metal edges, this thick. Um, and that was the state of the art at the time. They were Karu Kodiak skis. Um, and you know, we thought we'd died and gone to heaven when we had those, and we had, they gave us Solomon boots, which were your lighter cross-country ski boots. And um, I would say now that's really not suitable, at least in the conditions we're skiing. Um, the conditions are much more variable, a lot more ice uh, or crust, <coughs> a lot more uh, creek crossings with open water, more exposed rocks. So now we're skiing with things that would have been downhill skis essentially 40 years ago. Um, and, and the boots are, are much heavier boots, the three pin bindings. Um, so the conditions, it, it now truly is a backcountry trail rather than just a cross country trail. Um, again, you can find groomed Nordic ski trails along the route if you want to, they're beautiful. Um, but if you're gonna do the whole thing, you really need probably a couple of sets of skis, one lighter, and one suitable for um, for telemarking, almost almost alpine. Yeah, um, we 
We tend to use skis uh, a little wider, um, different widths. People have their own choices, but with fish scales and metal edges. And we would not have skied two days ago if we did not have the metal edges. Uh, it, it would not have happened. Also, the, the uh, boots, um, some of us use the old uh, tele gear, you'd call a three-pin binding. Um, there's some NN bindings. There, there's a multitude. Rossi has a new binding, a high-tech binding. Um, so there's a multitude of choices. And depending on where you are, uh, what you might use. I have, I have two sets, minor, narrower, um, just my own philosophy. Um, but some sections are, are snowmobile trail or groomed cross-country trail or rail bed. Um, and so you might want a little narrower ski. Um, but you can ski any of it. Um, even the even the downhill stuff, uh, bolting the trap. Uh, there's a there's a big climb and a big downhill, and um, I I've skied the whole thing on on some narrower skis than a lot of people use today. But but that's a personal preference. Yeah, I skied the first two days with my Nordic thin skis, no metal edges. But I I would suggest if you um, if you want to get out and ski a section, it's a great idea. To, you can call the Catamount Trail Association. They could let you know who the local trail uh, guy, uh, trail chief is. Chief is. Um, and we, you know, both Bob and Kevin and Jay are all trail chiefs, and they can connect you with them, and they can tell you what the conditions are like. Um, I hope it's okay to volunteer you. Yeah. Um, because, you know, there may, there may have been an ice storm. Like one section we went through, there was branches everywhere. That would be good to know before you went out. Or... Um, there, you know, if there was a high winds with blowdowns, you might want to know that. So you know, calling ahead and uh, talking to these people who have been doing the trail, you know, managing it for years is a great way to get to that local knowledge. You can also go to the uh, CTA website and uh, click through there. They have a gear list with photos, uh, different skis, different boots. Um, might help if, if you're not haven't done this type of thing before, um, just to get you started. But I would say just, you know, the, the, what concerns me about the word backcountry is it sounds like it's some elite extreme sport. Anybody can ski this trail on the right section. You know, might want to wait for the right conditions. Um, it's really, don't, I encourage you, don't be scared off by it. It's, it's beautiful, and as Vermonters you know, I mean, being out in some of these sections where you're a couple miles from the road and just beautiful landscape, you know, it's why people live here. It's... You, the film mentioned and you just mentioned snowmobile trails, and I was wondering how much overlap you have with those, and are you looking to get away from that? So we have been uh, getting off snowmobile trails and rerouting where possible. Um, and if we, we hold tours, um, we try to run on the snowmobile sections uh, during the week, not on the weekend. Um, but we've, we've had no problem. And it's, it's nice. Uh, most of your snowmobile trails are groomed. And if you're a beginner, that's a good place to start. Yeah, I'll add that. Uh I don't know if we would have been able to ski from Massachusetts to Quebec in 1984 if not for the snowmobile trails. They're a great way to make miles, uh, and they're easy skiing. I love to ski on skinny skis on snowmobile trails. And in the early years of the Catamount Trail Association, we had someone from VAST on our board. And one of our projects was to try to improve relations between snowmobilers and skiers. And uh, we did articles in the VAST newsletter and in the Catamount Trail News about the etiquette of ch shared trails and the idea of get out of the way, stupid, and wave and slow down, stupid, you know, and uh, j just some basic things. And uh, I think there was a lot, there's a lot less tension now between uh, motorized and non-motorized uh, recreation users. <coughs> 
I do appreciate that the Catamount Trail is trying to move away from the snowmobile trails, um, but uh, I still think it's a good idea for uh, cross-country skiers to join their local snowmobile club if they're going to use the trails. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, I, I worry for the future of snowmobiling with, with climate change. We learned, we, there was one night um, on the first, tr first trip we did in 84 where we'd go into a certain ski area and we would use the map to go over the trail we wanted to ski with the local pro and um, then they would guide us. And we had one night where the local pro got us lost. And we twice that night voted on, between the three of us, whether we were gonna spend the night out there, which we were not prepared for, uh, or continue. Um, and over the horizon, we heard this bzzz. So we skied down to the snowmobile trail, and frankly, we would have had a real rough night had we not met that snowmobiler who could say, okay, here's, here's where you need to go from here. So they really are people who love the outdoors like we do in a different way. Um, actually, Jay and I went snowmobiling today, and, so, and snowmobilers go cross-country skiing. So it, it's, it's a real um, partnership. Uh, some of their bridges are just amazing. Um, but also, we're now seeing the Vellamont Trail, which is a, uh, a, a mountain biking trail through Vermont. We're also trying to cohabitate with them, if you will, share trail where necessary. They build amazing bridges through some wetlands. Uh, so again, there's a partnership there. So it's not as if, you know, we don't want to be antagonistic at all. These are people who love the back country like we do. Jay. Hey, Bob, could you just talk about the free tours that the Catamount Trail runs uh, throughout the season and how people can get on those? Sure. So we, uh, the Catamount Trail offers uh, several multi-day tours which cover the length of the Catamount Trail for the winter. Um, they, they are free. Um, you just need to go online and sign up. There's also many single day tours. Uh, some are, some are backcountry where you're using skins and climbing up and skiing down uh, because a lot of those backcountry uh, groups such as Bolton and uh, I know Rasta, it's not that anymore. <laughs> but um, they, they have multiple trails that they've, they've nurtured and built um, and they're all part of the Catamount Trail. So e even if you have a hankering for that and you want to ski in Braintree or Bolton, um, they, they, have, they are part of the Catamount Trail Association. Um, so, so you could go online, and I think we're on tour number eight coming up this weekend. Um, and they're four-day tours. You sign up for one day or four and uh, all offered free um, on, the, on the Catamount Trail website. And they're led by really experienced guides like, like Bob and Kevin who also carry safety equipment which you wouldn't normally have yourself if you were out on the trail. So it's a, it's a great way to experience the trail. Um, it, if you want to learn more about this also on, on March 2nd, we're having our big 40th year event. March what? Third. 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 Sunday, March 3rd. Okay, Sunday, March 3rd. Um, uh, up at Trap, and um, there's tickets online at the, uh, on, at the webpage, but it, it'll be a big fun event. Uh, skiing for the day, um, as well as there's um, a cocktail hour and dinner that night and events and ceremonies and probably another raffle. We're gonna make speeches. <laughs> All right, and, Not, nothing's perfect. You're and you get to ski with us. Our speeches. <laughs> But yeah, we encourage you to come if you can. What he said. <laughs> you know, one other thing I'll just mention that was really cool to notice uh, coming along the way is that the generations are passing now with the, with the trail. So um, I'll say that, you know, Jay's dad was a, a board chair for many years, very influential. Um, in the development of the trail and, and, now, and its ongoing nature. And now Jay is, his son, is a board chair. And we met um, a couple of, uh, 
a young lady on the trail, young by our standards, um, who was just taking over a section from the prior section chief, a generational change again. And, and just the almost reverence with which she talked about the last trail chief and how he taught her how to, how to care for this section of the trail. So it's really an amazing thing to see. And uh, you know, we hope you get involved. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We, d we do have a blog that's posted every day on our trip. So if you go to the Catamount Trail website, click on the Ruby Run Tour, you can see how we're making progress. Well, thank you guys so much. Good luck on the rest of uh, on the rest of the adventure. Um, and one one last thing, um, I'm a little disappointed. Scott is not going to be using those skis, um, but he, uh, if anyone is interested, he he's willing to auction those off right now, and all proceeds would go to the Catamount Trail Association. So, if anyone is interested, a pair of Fisher Transalps. Start at five bucks? <laughs> <laughs> start at 10, 25, or we start at? 50, you start at 50? You start at 50. Anybody go higher than 50? No? What? Alice, Alice is 55. 55. 60. Anybody go for 65? What's the retail? <laughs> You're asking the wrong guy, I sell books. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody higher than 65? 60, 70? Okay. Anybody else? 75. 75? Oh, 75. Anybody for 80? Is that it? Is that the last call? 100. Oh, 100. Okay. <laughs> All right, 105 anybody? 100 going once, going twice, $100. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Appreciate the support, and we'll see you out on the trail. Thanks for coming out.